Hi, I'm Donald Fisher, co-founder and CEO of Tidelift, and it's great to be here today at Upstream. What I'd like to share with you are some personal findings from our expedition upstream together that resonated with me. So for a little context, when we created Upstream two years ago, we had a pretty straightforward idea that people should get to know better the upstream ingredients that make up their software applications. And that means meeting the people that make those ingredients. In fact, that's why we called it Upstream, which Wikipedia defines in a software context as the direction that is toward the original authors or maintainers of software. We wanted to bring together open source maintainers and the people who use their software as ingredients for broader applications. In all of this discussion, the food metaphor is apt. And that food analogy seems to fit better today than ever. In fact, Nithya from Amazon referenced it in her fine dining versus home cooking analogy in her upstream remarks earlier. And specifically, Nithya drew inspiration from the farm to table movement where the combination of transparency and sustainability make things work better for producers and consumers in that case of food. Now this all gets to why we thought a one day conversation with and about our open source software upstream would serve the mission we chose for Tidelift back when we started to make open source work better for everyone. If we get to know each other, learn more about both the people who create open source and those who use it, and what both of those parties want and need, we can actually make open source work better. So I'd love to use my time with you, you here today to share a few of my personal findings from today's expedition. What are some of the key insights that you might take away from Upstream and back to your organizations and communities? And how might you apply those insights yourself to make open source work better from where you sit? So without further ado, my first finding is that open source security is definitely having a moment that we collectively cannot afford to miss. In his keynote earlier, Mike from the Eclipse Foundation shared some data points about the rise of open source and how it now makes up 80 to 90% of the code in most modern applications. And we see the same thing in our own research. Our Tidelift data shows that over 90% of applications contain open source components these days. The moment that open source security is having, as you've probably gathered from several of the discussions today, is a confluence of both some recent high impact vulnerabilities, many of which impacted open source, as well as the response to those vulnerabilities where government and industry have been paying a lot more attention to this area. Now, interestingly, due to the broad government and industry attention, cybersecurity is now being talked about at the highest levels in many organizations, often where it wasn't before. And it should be talked about at those levels. As CISA director Jen Easterly has said, when cybersecurity is considered a core business risk, which it now is, it will be owned by the CEO and the board. And Alan from CISA in his remarks today pointed out that while organizations are generally supportive of efforts that improve their security posture, he's been directly told by large organizations things like, we like this idea, we'll do it when someone makes us. Well, that's actually happening now, especially as governments get more involved in setting guidelines and policies around software su supply chain su security with open source and cybersecurity more broadly. And in organizations of all sizes, including some of the largest, leaders are following this all closely and actively responding. As part of today's sessions, I was able to host a really interesting chat with senior executives from both Boeing and Cisco. And in that conversation, Veronica from Boeing made abundantly clear that her organization is watching these new government initiatives really closely. In particular, we discussed how the conversation has advanced from the 2021 White House Executive Order on Cybersecurity, which launched the public policy agenda around this area in the US, through the definition of the NIST Secure Software Development Framework, which documents specific requirements for software security development practices, and through to the OMB Memorandum M2218 that defined what specific actions U.S. government agencies need to take and when they need to take those actions. Now, all of that culminated just a few weeks ago with the release of the U.S. National Cybersecurity Strategy, 
which sets a long-term direction for cybersecurity, including open source software supply chain considerations. And one of the biggest pieces of news in the national cybersecurity strategy is the shift in how liability will work for software and cybersecurity issues. Quoting the policy, responsibility must be placed on the stakeholders most capable of taking action to prevent bad outcomes, not on the end users that often bear the consequences of insecure software, and importantly, nor on the open source developer of a component that is integrated into a commercial product. As Mike pointed out in his remarks, it's really great to see the important role of independent open source maintainers being reflected here. However, this conversation is ongoing and it's not happening uniformly across the world. For example, Mike also pointed out that in the European Union, there are still some unsettled questions in their policy definition relating to open source maintainers and liability that they may face. And those questions really need to be addressed. Now, fortunately, governments worldwide are actively engaged in conversation on these important topics. In the case of the US, an explicit part of the US national cybersecurity strategy is a mandate for proactive US federal government involvement in open source communities. And you saw that demonstrated today in Alan of CISA's call for engagement during his remarks about uh, software supply chain security. Meanwhile, at Tidelift, we're hearing organizations contending with all sorts of difficult challenges with this shifting landscape. So some organizations are looking to create a centralized repository of open source components that have been verified to meet some specific requirements for their own security hygiene. And other organizations are looking to create software bills of material and demonstrate their software uh, secure software development compliance. Some organizations are already focused on the new cybersecurity liability frameworks that are being signaled by the National Cybersecurity Strategy, and they're looking for ways to demonstrate that their organizations are following the required secure development practices. Other organizations are looking for sources of attestation data that they can incorporate into existing processes that they have underway and controls that they have in place. And then as it relates to the M2218 self-attestation requirements, we see organizations that are both suppliers to the US government, as well as government agencies themselves, looking for solutions to be able to create those attestations or receive them. There's a lot to be figured out here, but it's great to see organizations of all sizes actively engaging to tackle these important questions. Okay, so moving on to my second finding from Upstream today, it's that open source security is a people challenge, not just a software or technology challenge. And I thought Julia stated this very eloquently in her talk earlier, that software is not just bits, it's, it's a socio-technical system and you simply can't abstract the people out of it. Julia shared a few examples of actual real life humans who are maintaining these projects we all rely on, like Jeff Geerling, and Nolan Lawson. And she drew the conclusion that if we are truly concerned about the health of the software supply chain that we depend on, we should also be paying attention to the humans who are part of the supply chain and how we treat them. You remember, may remember this chart from our State of the Open Source Maintainer Report panel, but 60% of the maintainers behind popular open source projects we all rely on consider themselves unpaid volunteer maintainers. Only 13% self-identify as full-time professional maintainers. That's a missed opportunity. And the same survey found that 58% of maintainers have either already quit or have considered quitting maintenance work around an open source project. Again, these are real people making up the supply chain we all depend on. And as Julia said, a complex socio-technical people system with people, many of whom are stretched to their limits at its core. Now, Lewis asked a very simple question in his opening remarks. How do we deal with this paradox? Perhaps one of, if not the only case in the world of supply chains where the people who are the suppliers don't self-identify as suppliers. Where the majority of these suppliers are essentially unpaid volunteers working on their own. I thought Gary, one of the co-maintainers of Log4j and other prominent Java projects, said it well in the maintainer state of the union panel today. 
He said, there's a reason why corporations employ people and pay them, because that's the best way to get work done. I don't see how open source can succeed long term without that. Getting paid should be considered normal, not out of the ordinary. If there are people in our supply chain and we need to do things to ensure we optimize the security of the components we all care about, we should align our interests with those humans and pay them to do the work. After all, this is considered normal in any other security related job in an organization. Why would it be any different for that 90% of your application that happens to be third party open source? In her talk, Lauren shared some results from the multi year effort we've made at Tidelift to pay open source maintainers to validate that they are following common software security practices. In this case, a focused experiment showing paid maintainers achieved a more than two times better open SSF scorecard score than the average open source package. So that's real results. And Lauren also shared that the percentage of our paid maintainer partners who have implemented some of the most critical security practices, many of which are now required under US government guidelines like the NIST Secure Software Development Framework or SSDF is really robust. Paying open source maintainers works. And maybe it starts to rebalance that relationship where those accidental suppliers can start to self-identify as actual suppliers and have the time in their lives to put in the necessary work. So that brings me to my third and final finding for the day today, which is that healthy, more secure open source can be a win for everyone. If we want healthy, more secure open source software, we can't think of it as a zero sum equation anymore. We have to think about how we can make sure everyone wins, both the creators and the users of open source. So going back to our Tidelift mission to make open source work better for everyone, how can we turn this whole situation around? Here, I want to go back to Lewis's remarks and reiterate a point that he made on our theme of the accidental supply chain. He said, we're building the first global commercial regulated supply chain that is composed of unpaid volunteers who don't think of themselves as suppliers. So very simply, if we want open source to work better for everyone, this is where we can focus. Let's agree on what secure development practices are required by organizations to meet the emerging policy and regulatory requirements. And then let's just pay our suppliers, in this case, independent open source maintainers, to adopt and document that they're following those practices. Let's partner with them and incentivize them, including financially, to do the necessary things to ensure the security of our software supply chain. But I also like the way Lewis framed the opportunity a little bit more broadly. Basically, he said, let's stop winging it and instead start creating an intentional supply chain with intentional, thriving, independent open source maintainers. When we all help maintainers thrive, we help open source thrive. We create better, more secure outcomes for the software we all depend on. And that's just not good behavior, it's good business. I mean, if you think about this as from a completely transactional standpoint, when maintainers thrive, the software that we all use gets more secure. Your organization gets more secure. You reduce your risk and your organization's risk. Now, we can create a world where organizations spend as much time or more proactively ensuring the robustness of their software supply chain as they do reactively chasing and patching vulnerabilities today, thereby getting out in front and creating better security outcomes. It just makes sense. As Nithya framed it in her remarks, to be successful, we have to work together. Global, global collaboration is key. And part of the challenge, as Nithya put it, is not just projects raising the bar on their quality, but fixing the expectations that we have for open source projects and maintainers to begin with. From the state of the maintainer panel, I thought this might be a good quote to close on. Checky, one of the co-maintainers of Log4j said, I did open source work in my free time. It's only recently that I'm discovering that you can actually learn a living doing it, doing open source. And I think it's a discovery for me, and I hope that this will become a possibility for other people as well. And that might require a change, further changes in the mentality of everyone involved. The fact is we can make open source work better for everyone. We just need to shift the mentality of everyone involved. We can, as organizations, treat our open source maintainer suppliers like any other critical suppliers to our organizations. 
and we can help open source maintainers thrive so that the software we all depend on and our organizations and societies rely on become healthier and more secure. Now that's an idea I know I can get behind and I hope you can too. Thanks for joining us here today at Upstream. We appreciate you spending the day with us and we look forward to continuing this important conversation with you.